Chris has decided to uh, take off, go home, chill out for a while. We left a little bit on the table. We're going to talk about that, but we're also going to talk about one of the most important inventions I've seen for aviation in quite some time. Let's get to it. Hey, it's vacation time. Lawmakers over last weekend decided to go home and uh, they won't come back until after Labor Day. And that leaves a lot of things on the table, just hanging out there. FAA reauthorization being front and center. The House has already done its kind of thing and you know they passed a bill and they shipped it over to the Senate and uh, House Major or Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says, hey, they'll get it done, no worries. But Commerce Chair Maria Cantwell from Washington expects to blow past the September 30th deadline, thinking that uh, they're just going to give it a, you know, an extension. They'll take care of it. Um, the big holdup is disagreements over the 1,500-hour uh, pilot training rule, and that gets pretty complicated. And there was an accident that stemmed uh, the that 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 rule that's already in place. So you know that'll take some time to get worked out. Um, and, but what happens if the deadline's missed and they just give it an extension? Well, all that money that we've been hearing that would be in addition to the FAA is stalled. And in and, and the way that the appropriations bill looks, it's the same numbers that would have been back uh, topping out at the FAA's reauthorization from 2018. So the F, there's a lot of pressure on the FAA if the uh, Congress fails to act. And uh, it could ease the pressure on actually preventing a government shutdown um, because they won't have to deal with this, but um, it's just bad form, bad form. And speaking of bad form, we also don't have an, any nominee for the FAA administrator. Uh, not a thing. So maybe while Congress is gone, the administration will slip a name in there for uh, work uh, when they get back to set up a hearing and get an administrator in place. So after 20 years and billions of dollars later uh, and a reauthorization package which says that there is no such thing as next gen, um, we're starting to get some next gen stuff. So let's go through some of it. Spire Global is a space to cloud data company. They have satellites that take pictures of, you know, for military purposes and other things, but they are under agreement with the European Space Agency to leverage this an architecture, a space-based architecture for civil aviation. The system is called Uriallo. I'm probably saying that wrong. It's from Greek mythology and it, and, and, uh, it uses radio signals to geolocate aircraft. Um, it's intended to complement current surveillance systems and add resilience to the European communications, navigation, and surveillance infrastructure. Super cool stuff. Uh, this would allow uh, ANSPs to track aircraft anywhere in the world from uh, takeoff to landing. Uh, they don't have to be physically located as they are today with either radars or ADSB transmitters. Um, so super promising and a significant boost to aviation safety. That's what NextGen's all about and more next-gen stuff in navigation. While the FAA is messing around with what they should do with ground-based nav aids and a program called DVT, and that's gonna take over 30 years to deploy, the Air Force and MIT just demonstrated a new navigation system called MagNav, using a magnetic map and artificial intelligence to learn. Uh, the Air Force and the MIT team have successfully demonstrated real-time magnetic navigation using a C-17 Globemaster and they did it over California. The demonstration is part of a, an overall strategy for navigation uh, resilience for GPS alternatives. Hey, we know that GPS is vulnerable but there are some really cool things that that are out there that the military uses and all I can hope for is the trickle down that someday that these concepts will be able to deploy in civil aviation. This is next gen stuff and more next-gen stuff coming about. Right on the heels of no next-gen program, Skycraft, an Australian company is that specializes in developing and launching small satellites for various purposes like Earth observation, telecommunications, and other scientific research. They've had two successful launches this year with an air traffic management focus. With those satellites, they have been able to complete the first trial of a space-based VHF voice communications program. This trial is uh, 
work for Operational VHS Aviation Services, and you're going to hear a lot more about it at the World Radio Conference, which happens this fall in Dubai. They're setting the stage for this kind of cool stuff. This is awesome. And now for the absolute coolest innovation, which I will call for next gen. This is tops them all. I'm just gonna show you a photo right now of what this thing is. Combination of several factors, EV tall, multi-rotor, cool stuff, but also meets a very important social need right here. Okay, we'll move off this topic. Smash that like button, like and subscribe. Give me a comment or two, Let, tell me whether you like or don't like, and tell me what you think about the greatest invention for aviation. <clears throat> hey, let's move on to fun facts. So less than 20 years after the first flight at Kitty Hawk by the Wright brothers, on May 3rd, 1923, the first nonstop tra transcontinental flight took place. Uh, it was a U.S. Army Air Service uh, Fokker T2, which is a high wing, it carried uh, 780 gallons, it had two pilots, they carried 25 gallons of water to stay hydrated, and it was so heavy, it flew just off the ground for a long time before it actually really got up into, into normal air. Uh, it actually flew at 90% power for the entire trip, and it was 2,625 miles, and they did that in 26 hours, 50 minutes, and 48 seconds. Pretty amazing. And then I thought about what other transcontinental records are there and how far have we come. And back in October 19, uh, 2021, the record for a car to cross the U.S. was 25 hours, 39 minutes at 110 miles per hour. Now, the Army was probably legal in doing what it was doing. The uh, transcontinental car thing, probably not so legal at an average of 110, but it did average uh, 20 miles an hour faster than the Fokker did on, on, the, on the surface. Pretty wild stuff, but what a, what a great time in aviation it must have been to have those kinds of records. Tune in next time. Ah, shit.